Hi everyone, it's uh, Zion United Church of Christ with our fifth Lenten uh, gathering. Hi everybody, it's uh, Hafida Sadika. I'm the pastor of Zion United Church of Christ in Sand Lake, New York. Welcome on this nice Wednesday evening. It's been a good day for me. I hope it's been the same for you too. Believe it or not, this is our fifth gathering. We have one more. Uh, this coming Sunday is Palm Sunday. It uh, This really went by. I know that's sort of cliche-ish, but this month has really gone by, and, and, and so has this Lent. So I hope that um, you can relax from the things that you've uh, been doing this, this week, this hump day, and uh, relax and um, just see what you get out of this, uh, this study. We are in the book of Isaiah chapter 43 verses 16 to 21. Uh, it is not one of the normal, um, well, it's not a gospel lesson, so we're not following um, you know, Jesus, as he makes his way through Jerusalem, we're, we're looking at a little bit of prophecy, uh, and, which is still very much connected to um, the, the Easter story, the resurrection story, and the whole life of Christ. Uh, but nevertheless, we're sort of entering it by another, another way. So uh, if you've got pen and paper handy, and if you have your Bible, either on your phone or you've got a, a physical one, uh, follow along uh, with what we're, we, we're going to be talking about. Um, again, just to remind you, this is not a study where you had to have, you know, done a little bit of research and know the, 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 the language or anything like that. But it, it, this is just coming at this, this passage through what you hear and what you sense and how it falls on your ears um, at this point in time in your life and in the life of the world. So the three questions that we're going to attend to are, are really easy. Um, what's happening in the text? What do you hear? What do you see the words doing? How they're taking shape? Um, how is this text happening in the life of the world or your world where you are and then where is this um this text uh alive in your life where is it has it been an event in your life uh and 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 how do you resonate with it that's really the simplest way to to put it so i will read the text um usually i will read it twice but this time around, I want to read it the second time through the Tanakh as it is written in the Jewish um, scriptures, the one that's, that's, that's uh, appealed to read from uh, in synagogue on a, on, a, on a Friday night and in other times that they gather. So uh, with that, let's begin. A little bit of um, a placement for for you. This text is old, uh, but it is good and it's important. And please remember that not all of the books, really not too many of them, were um, were written contemporaneously with what was happening. They, what was written down by all of the writers and the editors happened years, decades after the event themselves. So with the uh, Isaiah text, as with all of them, uh, these have been written 70 to 100 years later after, um, in this case, the people of Israel, some of the people of Israel were um, set free, they were led out of Babylon, like they were led out of Egypt um, a, a long, long, long time before this time. Um, 
and so they're trying to remember they're trying to remember what that was like they were trying to remember where the people were the community as it was and how to make how to go forward with their lives after having that experience having people uh, knowing people who went into exile who were enslaved and taken away from home and then having some die while they were away and then having come back home with babies with uh with with uh people who were small but now they are 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 grown or they you know they're much much older so if this is a writing backwards they're looking back and they're trying to make sense of their life now back home and in light of the continuing issues that any community of people have and this is a diverse community so you have you know older younger uh people who remember things all kinds of different ways people coming at being in community from different um, angles of understanding of, of how they fit in and where they feel the community needs to go uh how how embedded in the past um they need to to stay so you have all of that going on so if it reminds you of any kind of, any, of a group <laughs> that you've been around, uh, everything there that you experience is, is what folk are experiencing here. Um, it, so another thing that I want to tell you is that, um, um, well, I'll, I'll leave those comments for, for another another time so before before these verses you'll see that we're starting at verse 16 so there's 15 verses before this so again this is you know israel uh, isaiah writing you know backwards trying to remember uh there there was the pronouncement that was made that you know get your stuff ready we're going to leave we're going to you know we're going to be free we're going to get out of that Ironically, it took another 50 years or so before all of that uh, took place. So there's a get ready, get ready. People are hearing get ready, get ready, get ready. Uh, but it still takes a little, it's going to take a while for it to actually happen. So in those first 15 verses, you get the promise that, you know, God makes to the people. I'm going to bring you out. Um, I'm going to settle you in a new place back home. Um, and I'm going to gather you from wherever and every place uh, where your kin uh, has been dispersed to Babylon and all the other regions uh, in that area. And the last verse, verse 15, uh, talks about God using Israel uh, as a, ambassadors or as messengers to uh, the nations that surround them, which are always more populous, always, you know, more, um, more money, all that kind of stuff. Uh, Israel seems to be always outmanned and outgunned uh, when they're um, dealing with other people. It's something that they uh, had to, uh, are always in the process of learning, aren't we all? Uh, but nevertheless, um, the promise is made that God will use them or is going to use them, even though Israel is blind and they don't hear. This is God's plan. And, and, and this is it. It's on. It's going to be OK, because that's the way that God sees things. But we'll talk about that. We'll talk about that a little bit more. So here is Isaiah 43 verses 16 to 21 from the New Revised Standard Version. Thus says the Lord, who makes a way in the sea, a path in the mighty waters, who brings out chariot and horse, warrior and army. They lay down, they cannot rise. They are extinguished, quenched like a wick. Do not remember the former things or consider the things of old. I am about to do a new thing. Now it springs forth. Do you not perceive it? I will make a way in the wilderness and rivers in the desert. 
The wild animals will honor me, the jackals and the ostriches. For I give water in the wilderness, rivers in the desert, to, drink, to give drink to my chosen people, the people for whom I formed for myself so that they might declare my praise. Now hear it again from uh, the Tanakh, the Jewish scriptures. Thus saith the Lord, who maketh a way in the sea and a path in the mighty waters, who bringeth forth the chariot and horse, the army and the power. They lie down together, they shall not rise. They are extinct, they are quenched as a wick. Remember ye not the former things, neither consider the things of old. Behold, I will do a new thing. Now shall it spring forth, shall ye not know it? I will even make a way in the wilderness and rivers in the desert. The beasts of the field shall honor me, the jackals and the ostriches, because I give water in the wilderness and rivers in the desert to give drink to my people, mine elect, the people which I formed for myself, that they might tell of my praise. So as we enter into um, this text, these few verses, let's see what, 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 what's going on. I hear uh, that this sounds like a new exodus. I'm going to bring you out. Uh, if you know the Genesis, the Exodus story, uh, it is a, a story of escape, of getting out of a place. And some of the verbiage that's used here is, uh, is used in the book of Exodus. So this is a new Exodus story. People are always going in into exile and coming out of exile. And there's some discussion about, you know, can you really get out of a situation? Can you really get out of bondage? There's so many different ways that we can be enslaved and we can be colonized. Um, sometimes the biggest uh, prisons that uh, people are, are in are the ones that they make themselves and often um, the ones that people make for us and we somehow get trapped in. I'm also hearing that, you know, this is, uh, God is in charge and nothing can thwart God's plans for Israel. It's going to happen as sure as the nose on their faces. Um, God is king. God is in charge. If you go back and read those first uh, 15 verses, it talks about, you know, the jackal, uh, the, the warrior and the army. You know, the king has an army. God will not be defeated. God's plans, you know, are going to take hold and they're going to come to fruition. So for Israel, uh, the king of Babylon is not their king. Uh, the Lord of hosts, their name for God, Yahweh is 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 their king and all of their uh, allegiance uh, is said to be with Yahweh not the king of Babylon or any other king any other nation state any other um, potentate God is king and I'm also saying uh, the use of water the imagery of water is runs all through the scriptures uh, through the Hebrew scriptures of what we're in and then also the Christian scriptures uh, the promise of water the promise of survival uh, the promise of success on their journey home uh, in Genesis we see the waters of chaos uh, taking form and 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 uh, bringing forth all manner of life and vegetation and then we see the people of Israel, uh, the ancient Hebrew people, leaving Egypt by uh, a, a flood, uh, the, the Red Sea, 
uh, them being parted so they can get through. And then we have the great flood. God starts again. And there's all, all kinds of images. But for us here, the, the image of water, water in the desert, water where rivers and streams have uh, dried up. And uh, if you've ever lived near a desert or lived in a drought or uh, been dependent upon rain because you are a, you know, a farmer and you plant and you have uh, crops to take care of because your livelihood <laughs> depends on it, you know the importance of water. Uh, you can go a little bit, you know, without food, but you can't go out, you can't go too far long without water. So these are big promises. These are just really cataclysmic um, things that God's talking about. Big selling points. You know, this is going to be the exodus in, in, in long ago. You think that was big. This is going to be an even bigger exodus. Uh, I'm your king. I'm going to make this thing happen for you. So some key words that, that did come up for me here were that God is a way maker. Uh, in the tradition that I was uh, brought up in, uh, we talk about God being uh, a, a God who makes a way out of no way, a mind regulator, a heart fixer. Uh, this is just real imagery. Uh, if nobody can find a way or make a way, God will and uh, things happening out of surprise, out of deserts. Uh, you know, God has a way, God has people, God moves by all kinds of ways uh, to make things happen uh, for, for God's people and, and for the whole world. I'm also struck by the words, do not remember the former things of God asking us to forget or asking the people of Israel to forget what happened in the past. Don't remember those. Uh, again, God is a water giver, rivers in the desert. And then also this discussion of uh, my chosen people or mine elect as the Tanakh has it translated. That's, that's, that's pretty interesting. Uh, also with um, God forming these people as the, 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 in the pen of the writer, God, God forming these people for this very uh, incident. Hmm. That gives me a little bit of pause. So what I see moving on to um, answer the first question of, you know, what's happening in this text I see that um, the exiles who had been living in Babylon for uh, for about 70 years or so are being told to trust God. <laughs> After 70 years, <laughs> with all kinds of prophets saying this is going to happen and that's going to happen and don't do this and stop doing that and uh, you know you're, this these are the people you know stay with your own that kind of thing. Now God is going to act. God's going to um, bring you out of this place after 70 years. 70 years is a long time. I, I can't remember how many years a generation is. Sometimes it seems to be shorter, uh, getting shorter. But uh, trust me, God said, trust me to get you out of here. I'm going to take you home. Um, yeah. <laughs> Why not a little bit earlier? Yeah, doesn't uh, I don't I don't know. So the the way that I started processing this for us and for you on your own is what would you do? I know this may be counterfactual. You know, we can't uh, say what we would do or how we would act or anything. But just for the sake of of the process, just for the sake of knowing that we are always in a state of being exiled or in a hard place, in a, in, a, in a crooked place, in a place where, you know, we don't see ourselves thriving and we see loss, we see um, no gains, we, we see risk, high risk. Um, 
what just, just sort of think about you know how would you feel how would i feel <laughs> if i'm hearing these words uh from a prophet uh saying that you know my circumstances are going to be turned around just wait just trust in god god's going to turn this around well you know we say that a lot even in our own day you know i'm going to pray for you i'm going to pray you know that god will make a way you know, God will send people to help answer, you know, meet you in your need, that kind of thing. But, you know, being in exile, being, you know, colonized, that, that's, that's sort of different. You are living in a place that's not your own, not where you were born, where you have no roots. You are living by uh, working for someone else, all that you have. Uh, really belongs to someone else. They give you what they want you to have. You live by a certain, you know, different set of rules. You had no choice uh, of the laws and policies. You just deal with uh, where you are because you have been colonized. You have been enslaved. So, um, what would you, what would you be talking about? What would I be talking about if somebody told me to get ready, Hafida? Your life is getting ready to change and it's going to be changed for the good. Um, I think I, I would be trying to think of how and who and when and what time should I have my stuff ready and wh by which way I'm going, when I can stop this work. Can I stop now? Uh, can I just give up? Do I, you know, what, what part do I have to play? I'm thinking those are some things that I would ask. What, what do, do I need to do? to effectuate uh, this exodus getting out of here. Um, I, I, I think those are some things that I would be asking knowing me. Um, I wonder about yourself. What would I take with me? Mm, that's another question I thought because, you know, moving here from Toledo, you know, I tried to take as few things as I could, uh, particularly things, um, if I, I hadn't looked at it in a year, <coughs> I wasn't gonna take. I wasn't gonna bring it here to Sand Lake. But what 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 things do you feel go with you wherever you are? Particularly if you know that you're gonna be gone for a while. Uh, I, my kids laugh about me and my KitchenAid mixer and my fountain pens. Uh, but I think pictures I have two uh, collages in a picture frame five by eight <coughs> excuse me and I take them with me everywhere I go one has to do with everybody in my bloodline who's passed uh, they, they are no longer living and the only way you get in that frame <laughs> is if you die and the other one has to do with mentors, people who have blessed my life in one way or another. Some of them I met, the majority of them I met, uh, some of them not because they were born long before me. And they are also deceased. These are two pictures that I always carry with me because they are reminders of me, uh, for me, of who I am, what I can do, where I'm headed, uh, what is possible for me uh, from where I am in, in this life. I would take those two pictures. Um, I Any clothes? Yeah, I can always think I was going to buy some more clothes on the other side, dishes, all that kind of personal stuff. I don't know. There was no rapid transit, no airplane, no, no nothing, no... Um, what's what's uh amtrak nothing like that so you're carrying whatever you have so you pack light and and you you, you take what you can what's most valuable and that in itself is uh, a study in itself how do you value things and um what a, what can you let go maybe you're carrying too much yeah that's a, that would be a good one so we come to um, some 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 verses that some places in these verses that are sort of difficult. Um, 
don't remember the former things. The book, the writer of this book of Isaiah, uh, don't remember the former things. How? How do you forget being displaced? How do you forget that loss? How do you forget um, being torn from all that you knew and worked for your heritage don't how do you how do you forget that and why i i think of my own uh, people in this country uh, african-americans black people uh, coming from it's impossible for me to know where my ancestors came from it's impossible by the good fortunes of you know uh, ancestry.com and all of these different places you you if, if there is a paper trail that's the thing you can you can find uh your folk some people have property that they can own that that they have, uh, which can serve as a link between uh, between uh, the the ancestors between time. Um, everybody isn't blessed with that, um, so sometimes your memory is all you have, and you know God is asking through the pen of Isaiah to forget all of that, like it didn't matter. Did it matter? Is that what God is saying? That it didn't matter? That that sort of rubs. <laughs> that sort of rubs. There are some people here in this world, in our nation, here, you know, where I live, they can trace their ancestry back and they have artifacts and they have all kinds of things uh, that where they have uh, memories, a good and bad and in between. Um, that that could, that's a blessing uh, but but why forget what happens when we forget uh, it's almost sort of traitorous traitorous like a traitor if you forget um, there's a saying that when people die uh, or they pass away they never die they're still here and people are alive as long as you speak their name and so I take that uh, to be uh, instructive uh, because of you know my inability to trace my lineage uh, not as far back as my great-grandparents or really and that's some a little bit of sketchiness there on both sides so um, I don't want to forget because sometimes the memories, and even if they are not all the way 100% accurate, that's about all I have in a, a, a big picture in, or, or a couple of pictures. The pinch part is uh, this last part of verse uh, uh, 21. My chosen ones, the ones I formed. When I, when I heard those, and every time I, I read that passage, uh, my elect were we chosen for this was Israel I'll get back with the text was Israel chosen formed to suffer this kind of displacement are they special in the sense that God chose them amongst all the people if that was a I don't know if that sound like a favor to me <laughs> to be enslaved, to be colonized, to be dragged away, to be, you know, m moving around and displaced and all of what that, that means. And even in your own time and then uh, for uh, the memory of people coming after you, uh, that, yeah, I, 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 I really struggle with that idea of chosen and being elect and uh, all of us can learn from 
each other nations and people groups and all of that we can learn from each other and i guess in a way we all can see ourselves as chosen and special uh i know america seems you know to you know have an understanding of itself as being exceptional and uh, god shed his grace on thee and uh, manifest destiny and all of those things that you can get into some thorny uh, conversations and rationalizations about uh, being chosen and being special whether you say it yourself and believe it and act on it or other people say it for you uh, either way around that that is another study and conversation to have God electing some people for goodness or weal or woe um, mm, to be a light to the nations to be an examples yeah I think there's something going in there in, the, in those those words those phrases that uh, need to be unpacked and it's more than we could do right now so that is um, what I am seeing in this in this text um, yeah just incredible things trust trust God yeah uh, I'm gonna bring you out don't freak don't remember the past look to the future keep your head you know looking you know faced forward so we get to the second question um how is this text happening around us around you who in our world uh, seems to be in a kind of desert literally and figuratively around you here in new york state here in the United States, here in the world? That's not a, a, a difficult question to uh, throw some answers at. Um, I can think of the uh, environmental crises that our whole planet is under. And I know, you know, it's, oh, there's nothing wrong. These are, you know, things that happen all the time. It's just that we're witnessing this time. But I don't know. We are so privileged here in the United States, although, you know, we have some unseasonable, unseasonable weather and tornadoes and all of these things and flooding and uh, rains that seem to be like, wow, this is this is unseasonable. This is a bit much than before. So if we if if we are groaning about, you know, things being a little bit out of order here think about around the world and smaller islands and other places where they are being eaten up and particularly those who um, are being impacted by um, the um, the by flooding and tsunami and all of those kinds of things um, the, the ground unyielding uh, pollution because of industry uh, being dumped into the you know the products of industry being dumped into the waterways and greenhouse gases and pollution and all of that stuff because of oil and, uh, and, and coal and burning coal and the toll that it's taking on uh, animal life our life uh, and the world that's that's a desert that's a desert if you depending on where you live uh, you may uh, feel differently, and you may answer differently about about that question. I think of economic deserts. Um, I personally want to say hooray for the Amazon workers who have uh, uh, voted to have a union. <laughs> there definitely are economic deserts where people work and work and work and and we talked about this a little bit before, and they have no say as to uh, the, the conditions under which they work and how much uh, they get paid and the safety protocols and, and all of those things that, that make a job worth going to and worth doing 
some folk have no say um, and they will always be strained for cash no matter how long they work they'll always so th there's some employment deserts um, I think of one place in um, in the south uh, factory workers in particular chicken factories where they're processing chickens and the standing in water working very fast lest and being trying to be very careful lest they you know cut their fingers off or get sick and i'm i'm remembering um when the pandemic pandemic was uh at its highest early on and folk were uh really calling in ill and dying because they didn't have any masks and they were standing, you know, almost chest to chest or shoulder to shoulder, I should say, with people who were coughing and feeling ill and then those who were not displaying any signs, but were, were contagious, but they had to continue to work because we need our chicken and we need all of that. And uh, people have, have given their, their lives for that. I'm thinking of families who have no wealth to pass down to their children uh, because none was passed on to them. Or they, they had it, but they lost it. Uh, that's, that's an economic desert. I think of racial and uh, class deserts. Of, all of us are, are caught up in this, uh, the drama uh, and reality of race and class. I'm thinking um, that some of us feel it more acutely uh, because of the way laws and policies are made and applied. Uh, we, we, we feel, uh, some of us feel the, the strain of that more acutely. Others of us can write it off or explain it away. At this time, I'm remembering uh, Reverend William Barber of the Poor People's Campaign and a brilliant thing that he's trying to do, he's trying to continue the work that Martin Luther King uh, started during the classic civil rights movement, uh, but it was called the Poor People's Campaign. Um, and the idea was that, yes, poor whites and poor blacks and poor Asians and poor Native Americans and poor, anybody who's poor, all of us, have the same need, all of us have the same grievances, all of us need to band together, not, you know, um, and as adversaries uh, of one another, uh, but when we come together, uh, then that's when things change, that's when things change. You can read more about him, Reverend William Barber and the Poor People's Campaign. I'm thinking of spiritual deserts, and this is really not limited to religion at all, but cultures that are held, uh, that have come down, I should say, with affluenza, the more stuff you have, uh, it has to be different, it has to be the hottest, it has to be the latest. Not all of us are given to that, uh, but uh, it, it, it is it is a desert it is a dryness it is a poverty it's a it's a, an enslaved mentality of of getting and consuming without knowing what you have and and ever being able to say you know this is enough and focusing on other things than that uh the stuff i'm thinking also uh spiritual deserts the cause of war and even as we hear about Ukraine and Palestine and all of these other places, Afghanistan, I'm, I'm thinking of the causes of war, uh, men's hearts, people's hearts, uh, uh, and yes, starting with them as individuals and then a culture that makes for war, uh, of getting things and positioning yourself and being involved in the governments, you know, of, of the, the workings of other governments and greed and all of those things fall together, greed and envy and uh, wanting more. Uh, 
that, that's a desert. That's a desert that a lot of people, um, we find ourselves, either you're actively in it or you suffer the effects of that. Um, it's, it's difficult. It, it, it's, it's a hard desert. Political deserts, yeah, an ordinate uh, influence of money in politics. Uh, we hire leaders to uh, legislate and argue and make, uh, argue fine points of law and process and um, to make policies and procedures and laws that uh, should speak for all of you know the people in this nation but money sometimes wins the day and that decides uh you know what what uh what items are addressed what causes are uh, advanced how monies are allotted uh, yeah money and politics that that's a kind of a political desert and people and communities are pawns they're they're pawns and uh, they're not um, represented or represented well uh, communities are played off of each other when i came here to to sand lake i i heard of the, the down the down south and the up north and there's antagonism between you know the two the people in the in, in down in new york get all the money and we up here don't get anything and you know how to how to make sense out of that but nevertheless if you have that kind of antagonism going on whether it's real or imagined or you know there's some truth in the middle of that uh that that can lead you to a desert to a a desert in your heart about what people are like up there and what are the people like down down there that they're not worthy or uh you know, they're just making it you know, a bad situation for all of us. So those are some deserts. And I know people in all of these situations in different states and friends and family. Yeah, this deserts, people are in wildernesses. Folk are, are dying of thirst. They're dying to thrive. They're dying to live. And uh, they're, they're, putting their trust in all kinds of people and processes and and schemes and then they may pan out and they may not or they'll bring up more questions and you know put out their own tentacles and um, you may not necessarily get what you want all the time or what you need so there's a lot to to process there and to trust God for it all that's it seems so easy to say that, um, but I always say that at the God is 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 closer to you, or, or or no farther away from you than when you look at the end of your arm, that that's your hand or the end of the the arm of the person standing next to you. That that God works through people. God works through communities of people. God works through. Um, nations, but but most God works through individual people who open up their hands and share and speak out and lobby and say enough is enough, and then that can turn the tide of leading somebody out of um, an intractable situation. Though that's where water is given, that's where ways are made. Uh, when when people do that, or what was going on in the mind of the writers of Isaiah and any of the book uh, of the Bible, um, you know they understood that God was doing this. But there's always people. Uh, Cyrus, as we talked about last year, last week, uh, was the one who really helped to push exile for the people of Israel. So a Persian guy didn't have anything to do with, you know, the, Yahweh, uh, Israel's God. Uh, he, he had his own thoughts, he had his own religion, had his own traditions, but he saw when something wasn't good and some folk who were in need and he gave the word and, and they were freed. So the last question, how is this text your story? 
What's been your story of being in exile, metaphorically or literally? Uh, what's your story of being thirsty for something? You don't know what it is, or maybe you do know what it is. Uh, and what did you have to do in order to get that thirst satiated or that hunger satiated? When were you in exile and how did you get out and who was there to help if there was anybody there to help? Where was God in all of that hunger and thirsting and, and that being exiled? Who, who was there and, and what, what helped you uh, find a way out of that situation that you were in? As we really wind up the this Lenten season, uh, what in this text resonates with you? Um, this idea of a chosen one doesn't resonate with me at all. I I would like to know my relative, my ancestors. I would like to have known uh, where they came from. I would like to have not had the uh, have to carry around the the knowledge of the the Atlantic uh, slave trade. I I would not like to to have had my parents and my grandparents and my great great parents uh, caught up in the South uh, during times of lynching and sharecropping. And I yeah. Everybody goes through their whole thing. Uh, their ancestors had a hard time, but being taken from your home and stripped of language and custom and all of that, that to give it up uh, voluntarily, that's one thing, but to have it taken away from you uh, is, is something different. And all, and, and to be, um, to have a nation that talks about freedom and equality um, and having to strike for that with every uh, generation uh, <laughs> and not and for you know the people in power in places not to say this is untenable and we're going to bring all the powers that we have and all of the the resources that we have to uplift communities and but there's always a shift uh to something more important something more pressing a, a wider uh, view of things instead of focusing on where damage is done and where people are hemorrhaging hemorrhaging can't say that where where they're bleeding uh, out resources and uh, patience and where there's chaos happening. Um, I would like not to have to carry that around, but I do. Because one thing that we do know from this text from Second Isaiah is all of Isaiah, in fact, is that they've used these experiences of hurt and displacement and recreated their lives into uh, something that is uh, forward-looking and healthy and um, that would cause them to thrive. And I think uh, that's one of the things that we have to do wherever we find ourselves in desert spaces or being exiled from family, from friends, from what you knew. There are a lot of different ways of, of being in exile that you find a way back or the way is shown or someone comes to you and leads you out of that exile, out of that desert. Um, that's, that's what we all that's the journey for all of us, all through our life. 
because there's ups and there's downs, there's uh, plateaus. Um, but we, fo we, we, we find a way, we, we find a way with God's grace and we write a new script and hopefully as people uh, in the 21st century that we're writing good scripts, we're writing good uh, narratives so that uh, they're not just for us, but they're for everybody uh, in this in this world, or at least the people who are nearest us and in the wider circles of where we are, that we make good on these um, promises that we hear from scripture and promises that we would like to make to ourselves and promises that are, are somehow been kept for us by our own ancestors. That, that when we go, when we're dealing with other people and other places and different situations that um, we see uh, that they are like us, that they are us. And all of us cannot move forward until all of us um, have what we need to thrive, to get out of the deserts that are created for us. As humans, we're always going to be creating and making mistakes and trying to find you know, exactly where we are and where we need to be and reconciling all of the opposites in our life. Uh, but that we, we, we make a way for one another, uh, that we are water givers, that we are uh, working for the good of everybody around us and, and and particularly strangers too. That's it. That's all that I have for uh, this evening. There are a number of things to pray for. Again, the people in Ukraine, uh, those particularly in the town of Buka. Uh, and other towns where there seems to have been just massacres, slaughtering of people and uh, people, children, women, elders, people on the street. Let's be in prayer for them. For our congregation, there are a couple people who uh, have undergone medical procedures and are healing. Let's be mindful of those in our families who uh, have, are undergoing states of dis-ease and need uh, companionship uh, and someone to accompany them in the shadows of their week and their, their, their time of, of trying to figure things out uh, that, that are definitely hard. So with that, and all of the ones that we know about, let's, let's close in prayer. Gracious God, known by so many names, the one that we know through the life and the death, the witness of Jesus of Nazareth, God of all comfort, God of grace and mercy and joy, we come this evening uh, thanking uh, you and others for the goodness that we enjoy today. We give thanks uh, that you, we have passed through hard times this week, this day. We thank you for, do, for making a way for out, uh, out for all of us, that you have given us the kinds of waters that we need uh, so that we could know who we are and where we are and, and which direction we need to go. Gracious God, whenever we find ourselves in desert places and tight spaces and in exile to ourselves or from our families, from those who love us and finding ourselves on the outside of political and uh, processes we ask that you do give grace that you will enlighten our minds and bring us aside with people who um, 
can pray <laughs> and people who can uh, protest and people who can uh, figure out and speak and deal with other folk who are seemingly in charge of processes that uh, we cannot or we don't have any effect on. This is a very complicated world in which we live in and we ourselves alone are just complicated. We can gum up our own uh, lives in so many ways. So we do ask for grace, we ask for guidance, we ask for patience uh, with ourselves and with one another. Give us a good night's rest. Give us clarity when we need it, and it is that we need it all the time. Give us uh, a patience and give us fortitude to continue on even when we don't know where we're going and we don't know how things will turn out but keep us going face forward, knowing that you are with us and that uh, you are in front of us leading the way. We ask all of these things in Christ's name we pray, amen. So there we are friends. And so I hope that um, you rest well and I'll see you next week. Bye-bye. Yeah. <laughs>